Good morning and welcome to the ARC's Culture and Community Design Information Session. Um, as you just saw, we've started recording this meeting, so we will be uh, able to share this with folks who could not be here in person this morning. Uh, I want to just a couple things before we get started. Our chat is open, and if you have questions anytime during this program, you're welcome to put those in there. We may answer them in the chat, uh, uh, or we may hold on to those because we know we're going to cover that later in the program. Um, but please put those put those questions in there. We'll also have times during the program where we'll be explicitly having questions and answers, and uh, we may just ask you to ask your question live at that point. All right, so I am going to just quickly introduce our team who's on the call here. Um, my name is Josh Phillips, I'm a Principal Program Specialist for Arts, Culture, and Creative Placement at the ARC. Uh, Molly Bogle is our Manager of our Community Development and Assistance Program, and she's going to be working really closely with our Community Engagements and the Arts team this year, who is uh, running this program. Um, and then finally, I'm going to introduce Marian Liu, who directs our community engagement and the arts program and is directing this, this, uh, this whole program. So we're real, all really excited to be here. I think we have some other colleagues at the ARC who are on the call, just listening in, and they're valuable parts of the team, but they will be observing today. Um, all right, so let's talk about what we're going to talk about today. So on the agenda, we are going to Marion will be giving a overview of our new culture and community design program, its development, its purpose, our intended outcomes. Next, we're going to welcome the leaders of Ballet Ethnic Dance Company, one of our organizational partners from the 2022 program from earlier this year. Very excited to hear from Nina and Waverly. Uh, after the discussion with Ethnic, I'm going to come back and talk about what to expect in the 2023 program, which we're kicking off right now, how it's structured, what we'll be covering in the class. Uh, Molly will be coming in to talk about how this program and this work is going to connect to other programs, other ARC funding programs. It's our intent that this, that the, the organizations that go through this program continue to be connected to our funding programs after the end of the program. And finally, we'll talk about how to submit a proposal to be considered as an organizational partner for 2023. And like I said, there'll be questions and answers definitely at the end, but also um, uh, um, after we uh, have a discussion with Bell, I think there'll be a chance for conversation and questions there. So by the end of today's session, <laughs> we hope that you'll be able to understand the background, purpose, and outcomes of this program. You'll have learned what the experience was like last year for our Bell Ethnic as an organizational partner. You'll understand the program structure, the content, and you'll know who to contact. So who, who do how to how to get in touch with us? Because although this is a this is our sort of formal information session, um, we do our our phone lines are open to discuss projects before the deadline as well, and we'll talk about that. So we hope that by the end of this, you'll have a pretty good idea of what you want to do next with this program. So um, with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Marion. Thanks, Josh. So as Josh said, I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of this program and. Um, how we came to it. And so the origins of this program really started around two years ago um, when our agency's arts and culture work came into the community development group. So before it had been in a separate group um, and was kind of, you know, doing its own thing, but now it's in the community development group. And we're really thinking about how specifically we can begin working more directly um, uh, with artists, with creatives and culture bearers to really make our planning and engagement efforts more inclusive and equitable. Um, and also to reach people in communities that have hardly ever participated in our uh, planning work um, or perhaps have not even heard about it. So in 2021, we began using our Arts Leaders of Metro Atlanta program, which some of you may be familiar with, um, um, ALMA, uh, which Josh led for several years as, as an incubator for this new, new approach. Um, and so we became much more intentional about including working artists, um, ensuring that the program was more racially and ethnically diverse, 
Um, and we became much more focused about who we wanted to bring together. Um, so that's artists and culture bearers, planners, um, and people working in local government um, to really think about creative and accessible ways um, to address some of our region's greatest challenges. Um, and so then earlier this year, we started uh, working with community-based organizations. Um, and so we were looking for these organizations that are really rooted in their community, um, especially communities that have been um, underrepresented um, or excluded from local and regional planning and whose missions are really centered around arts and culture. So we brought um, you know, the talents of the people who are participating in our program to work with these uh, with three community-based organizations on specific ideas that they were interested in pursuing. Next slide. Oh, um, so, you know, over the, the past two years, we've been germinating this new program. Um, we call it a program, but again, it's really a, a just a different approach to our core work of planning for the future growth and development of the region, and also working with um, and supporting the communities who really know best about, um, you know, they know best what they need. And so this is where we are today. The purpose of this program is to um, advance arts and culture as an essential part of inclusive and equitable planning um, in Atlanta's communities. Next slide. And the desired outcomes of our program are that community-based organizations are really ready um, to lead local and regional planning processes with ARC as a collaborator and as a conduit to funding um, and uh, implementation. And that artists, culture bearers, planners and designers and local government um, folks can collaborate on planning and engagement projects. And then thinking about how these lessons um, that, we, that we're learning um, can really foster more inclusive and equitable planning and, and be shared as best practices. Next, next slide. And so the three community organizations, the one of which is here today, um, that we worked with earlier this year is Olive Institute, Bell Ethnic, um, and Wheel of Buford Highway. Next slide. And to give you an idea of, of what we're looking for, but please don't let this you know, narrow, narrow or limit uh, what you're thinking about. The Olive Institute um, is a cultural center that really promotes awareness and education um, and connection um, about Arab cultures. And they are located um, along the proposed path of the Petrie Creek Greenway, uh, which is a multi-use trail, bike, um, bike and pedestrian use trail. Um, and the and Olive is really trying to come up with ways to think about how they could connect their property um, and the activities, cultural activities, um, cultural education that they do um, there and connect that to the Greenway and this trail. So how can they you know, think about their property um, differently as a place of temporary and permanent art installations, performance spaces, gathering spaces, and how that could really, um, really enhance the whole experience of, of the Greenway. Um, next slide. Um, and Bell Ethnic, this is one of the recommendations that came out of the project team that they were working with is, you know, they are also thinking about connectivity with downtown East Point um, and how, you know, their work and their artistic practice and medium could really be expressed through, um, for example, a sidewalk um, uh, uh, activation, a sidewalk art installation. Next slide. And we live Buford Highway, um, you know, is an organization that's focused on cultural preservation and immigrant advocacy along the Buford Highway corridor. And they um, really were looking for ideas on how to um, share the stories that they've been gathering from their community members um, throughout the corridor. So they have a community newspaper that is going to share these stories and it's going to be distributed at kiosks, newspaper stands um, that are designed by artists. Um, at different gathering places uh, throughout the corridor. Next slide. And so, which brings me to our conversation um, today. You know, we're really excited to have Nina and Waverly here with us today to talk about their experience and maybe share um, share what they experienced and and how um, you know they really um, were involved with us last or earlier this year. So Nina and Waverly, do you want to, you know, introduce yourselves and give a little background on Bell Ethnic, 
um, your mission and, and what you do? Awesome. Okay, I can start. I'm Nina Gilreath. I'm one of the co-founders of Bal Ethnic. And we started the company 32 years ago. And most of that time, 30 of it has been in East Point. And our whole mission was to create access and opportunity for those who did not get that access and opportunity in the classical arts, particularly using Bal Ethnic as a ballet as a vehicle for social change and to dispel all types of stereotypes along the way. So Tag, Waverly, you want to add to that? Uh, yes, um, I think uh, a big part of my emphasis has always been on community. Um, I think a lot of that came, stemmed from my uh, dance or development project. I saw a need, a social need within the community and a need that uh, occurred with me as a young black male uh, growing up in Detroit and basically uh, selecting a career that was pretty much uh, non-traditional. And um, I knew if I had this desire and, and willingness to engage in this, there would be others. You just had to create um, the environment and a space for it to occur in a safe and nurturing environment where you know the young men also receive the mentoring in order to benefit from it. And so I think for me, the community-based aspect uh, basically is the biggest part for me because I believe that um, what we're doing in the arts has to have an effect on our community uh, society and humanity as a whole. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so I'm, I'm going to just get right into it. What was it about the program? Um, you know, because you all were really, I don't want to say, uh, what you, you, you know, you, this was the first time that we had in our arts and culture work really decided to partner with community-based organizations. And so it was new for us. It was new for you. I want to ask you, you know, what was it about the program and this idea of working with us that interested you? Um, you know, how did you see this, this kind of collaborative approach across sectors? How did you see this really, you know, aligning with the mission and goals of, of Bell Ethnic? Um, I, I would say what interested me most is that I could learn more about the connectivity between the arts and how development worked, how things grew outside of the studio. So many times as artists, we are immersed in the work that we do. We stay in the studio. But for us, since we came to East Point, we had lofty goals of what we thought that we could do in terms of building a destination where people would want to come to East Point to dance and to come to our community programming. And that has happened all of the 32 years but it was kind, it was accidental that it was all happening. It wasn't really thought of because we didn't know. We're artists, we're technicians in the arts. So along the way, I knew that there was something that was missing. So when we saw this opportunity, I was like, we can dig down and we can learn more about how the two things come together and how we really can work to build this destination Bal Ethnic East Point as this cultural destination in a better way and get input from different people that would see us in a different way because they were not engrossed in the day to day. So that's what was really exciting. And knowing Josh from long ago and oh so far away from the Metropolitan Atlanta Arts Fund, I knew that I had someone that I could trust, that there was a link of trust, that he was all in it for the arts and for artists. And many times we don't feel that or know that an artist primarily, a lot of times we're sensitive people. So trust is a big aspect that we can trust our ideas, our hopes and our dreams and put it in a place where someone can help us to bring it to fruition. Okay, mine is pretty simple. Uh, Nina took it at the last minute. <laughs> and my, my reason was Josh. Like I said, uh, basically our longtime relationship with Josh, um, the, the, the basically seeing his lifelong work 
of, of advocacy and, and basically working towards inclusion, things like that, and always uh, creating a space for us and you know, uh, marginalized organizations like ours and making sure that we're you know, at the table. That was a major part for me. You know, I, I think, you know, like I said, your relationships mean so much to us and that relationship is one we cherish. Mm -hmm. So can you, can you, so you came here for Josh, but what were, <laughs> what were your expectations of, of, you know, being a part of the program? And I, I know Nina spoke to that a little bit, but. Okay. Waverly, well, go ahead, Waverly. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually coming out of Alma. I kind of had a taste of, of you know, what could do because um, that the Alma experience actually um, opened my eyes to some realities as far as uh, potential collaborative efforts with the community and with uh, the business sector that previously I had not really you know, engage in, as Nina pointed out, because we're focused in the studio. So we, you know, we, we have outreach, but the outreach always uh, is limited to pretty much engagement with students, performances, things like that. And um, what I think the Alma experience and then going into the ARC, it uh, further it, um, encouraged me that it, the, um, the necessity for us to be a part of, you know, even the strategic thinking of how things could be, how, you know, to reimagine how, you know, we engage with our community, how we engage with the business sector, and to always keep that in the forefront and not, you know, put it in the back. So now that you've had a little more time to, you know, engage with the ARC, um, you know, I'm really curious to know, like, what was your awareness, um, you know, about what the Atlanta Regional Commission does? And then maybe what did you gain throughout uh, or through this, this program and this, this work? Because I, I know, you know, like we've talked about what is the next step after this, right? And, and we, since it was also our first time doing this, we learned so much about from you all about like what needs to happen next. So how can the ARC be an effective partner to community organizations like, like Bell Ethnic? Marion, that was about three different questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to go back and figure out which part to answer. <laughs> well, I'm sure you're gonna give about five answers to each. <laughs> well, connections, I think the ARC, you guys are connected to everyone in business. So anyone that we wanted to connect to and to find out a resource that we might need, we know that we can connect to you to find out. We know that you have trouble, you have problem solved and you have people in your realm that can help problem solve. So again, many times artists, we're so insulated, isolated, the very dreams that we hope to accomplish, like one of our dreams was to have a more regional approach. And we've always done that. We've always worked across Metro Atlanta and students have always come to us, but not really fully understanding all the things that impact that, that there's traffic, there's development, there's infrastructure. So learning more about those things from other people was crucial and that there are pathways to doing things to get to the things that we desire. So um, one example is that Aero Beltway landed across from Balethic and we really didn't know what it was or how it landed there. Again, because our heads were down. In the different iterations of business, there are different problems that we're solving as founders. So there is about, gosh, I would say 15 years that we were just saving ourselves. So we couldn't even lift our heads. The earlier years, we were out and about and we did go to all the city council meetings and this, that and the other. But then those 15 years, it was like, we're going to save ourselves or we're going to tank. So we weren't seeing what was happening around us. And then with this project, we were able to see, oh, Aero Beltway is part of Aerotropolis. I had spoken with Shannon James before the pandemic hit and talked about connecting and having an arts component and how we could work together to achieve that regional approach and benefit from being at, around the airport for all these years. 
But with you all, we were able to connect solidly right away. And since then, we've had a meeting. Shannon has come out to Balethic and we've talked. And even tonight, um, the company is performing for the pre-reception uh, for the Aerotropolis Awards. So we're connected now. So that's a resource that you helped to solidify. And the ARC has a name in the business realm. So whereas we talk about art and the greatness of art, you guys can help us tie that together so that we can move beyond or we can reach our artistic dreams while being in a solid place where people know where we are, where we have the destination, where we have the marketing appeal, where businesses know Bal Ethnic is in this region. It's part, it can be a part of that whole Aerotropolis expansion. So that's something we would not, I feel like, been able to do more readily without that impact of this project. And then to meet and reunite with some of our colleagues that we'd work with long ago to circle back around and work with them and for them to fully engage and hear what our mission and purpose is beyond what they see on the stage. Because people get a perception, they see one performance and they think that's all of who you are. They don't know the integral part of getting through three decades plus of work. It's not an accident. And there's more than what you see on the stage. So our team was able to see that. They could hear about marketing ideas, how we would like to engage more with MARTA, how we could get that pathway of dance positions to East Point. So it really gave us a trail of ideas to insert in our strategic plan and ideas that we could share with our staff that we're building and things that could help build the layers to the next effect. Now Bal Ethnic is a Southern cultural treasure as designated by South Art. So that's a huge thing and it was a huge grant process, but I think all of these things matter because it shows that we're thinking beyond the studio. And again, to be redundant fully, as an <laughs> arts technician, we think about the excellence of the product, but then there's so much more. And I think being able to see that, and even it was an affirmation for ourselves that we've done so much more than we can even remember as the accidental business people in a different way in terms of like developing our block. So you guys just helped us in so many ways and that team of seeing the vision, helping us see other projects that we kind of started, but that we could really fully implement was really, it, it was a great experience. Well, good. Good. I'm glad you had a great experience. And just for the people, uh, you know, people who may not know, can you explain who Shannon is and Aerotropolis? Oh, goodness. I think I should do it. But um, Shannon James is the president of the Aerotropolis. Many people, like for me, I would see the billboards mm -hmm. and I really wouldn't know what it is, but it's about um, development around the airport area so that things can collaborate and work better together in our region and that we have the same amenities as other parts of our region have at a high level. So he has an alliance of businesses that come together to work together for the good of that. That's my words, but anybody can add to it. <laughs> Waver Waverly, do you want to add to the five answers that were actually that no, were in there to she, my three questions. She, she hit everything on that one. So it's like I would just be redundant. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So my my question is my next question is a little bit about, you know, your program experience. Like um, you know, we've we've put on the website, and Josh will talk about this a little bit more, but you know, we ask um for certain commitments from our from our community partners. And so do you think you can maybe in your own words, describe how that experience was, you know, do you feel like you were asked to do too much, too little? Um, if you could talk about that. No, I, I would say, you know, it, it was good because uh, Nina pointed out how sometimes we get absorbed in uh, our studio, in our space of performing, doing the things that we do normally to keep, you know, keep things going. And I think what it allowed us to do is to come out of that comfort zone and to you know, open ourselves up to learning uh, different things. You know, 
uh, it wasn't always new things, but it was in learning things a different way, thinking about it a different way, looking at it uh, with a fresh mind, not worrying about uh, performance, things like that, uh, next production. And no, we were able to go there and, and really to actually dream a little bit, you know, and to think about what could be to speak it and to then, you know, have others who could help embellish, but, you know, the um, ideas that we had and to offer new ideas and some, some many that we actually hadn't even considered. So I think that was very important. And, you know, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's very, uh, it's, it's a necessity for artists, you know, that's what I see because you, at some point you have to go beyond just the, the, the actual art making. You know, what I always say is there's no dance without finance. And what you're doing is you're creating a gateway and uh, access to uh, more finance. And I will say that in terms of a big project that the staff can see from the groundworks and see how it was unveiled was really great. Lisa Smalls is on the call, but she was able to help keep us on track and to speak to ideas. And then um, Suzanne Gordon as well, just to see how a seed can expand or a seed that's been there for a long time can be sprinkled and watered in a different way. And for them, the staffing to connect with other people and hear their ideas. Again, often we're very siloed because of some of the things like traffic or just really not making our way out because of the day-to-day -day minutia that will just keep you solidly in your space. And I think it was good for them to be able to welcome and to host um, our team when they came on site and the excitement of the team on that first day, everybody buzzing around in our community was really palpable because it was just fun to share, you know, what we've done all these years. And for people, many times it's their first time at our space. You see Urban Nutcracker, or some of the big ballets on the stage, and you don't realize where it happens, where all of this great art comes from and the sacrifice that it takes. And then to see even with that, that there's an even bigger vision that's coming forth. And to be able to show our neighbors, we've been here in East Point this long, and finally people are catching up to what we already knew. <laughs> Cause I mean, really we took a lot of hits back in the day. Everybody's like, why are you not centrally located? We don't wanna go to East Point, it's too far. Yeah, Marta is right there, people. Marta. <laughs> One of the interesting things <laughs> is the uh, minister from the church on the com uh, on the corner actually came and joined as we were walking oh, through. Yeah. This was a new minister, and it was the first time, and he gave us cards out and everything. So immediately that, you know, he became interested. And so that opened a dialogue also for us. That happened on, during the site visit? Absolutely. Yes, he tagged along at the end when we were walking around the little curve to Norman Ferry. He came out of nowhere, <laughs> and vanished out of nowhere. I was like, "Whoa!" I thought I thought that was maybe someone from the city. Okay, but yeah, <laughs> no, I love that story. So now you all are connected to your neighbors through, you yeah. know, our, the site visit that you took us on. I think. Well, so Josh, I mean, put in the chat too that or. Um, our side chat that you know, even though he has known about you for so long, Josh, you want to you want to just say what you what you said, because it because this goes to what um, Vina was talking about how you know people can just see the Urban Nutcracker or just see one performance on the stage and not realize like what is the depth of your connection to to community. Yeah, that's right, and that's that's I've I've known Nina and Waverly for just about 20 years um, in the community, um, the, the artistic work and their, their sort of general community leadership in the arts community. But I was really still kind of ignorant about like the depth of the work in the community of East Point. And, and of course, you know, like we, as we were starting and we were listening to Chloe and Hallie on the background, they're like, oh, yeah, those are those are Bell and Nicolana. They danced with us when they were when they were younger. Like I, there's like so much that there's such a richness of of 
an organization like Bioethnic and its experience in community and leading and leading this community that it's like, I, I didn't know that even after 20 years of knowing the organization and, and knowing its leadership. So I think having intentional conversations about this in a program like, uh, like, like our program is, I mean, it's a two way street, we're learning continually through this as much as I hope that the participants are and the organizations are as well. So thank you for, thank you for that. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> great to be taken off your own grid, grid and to be able to focus on something that, like for us, that we put on the back burner and those things about the accessibility to downtown East Point. Most people just, just didn't realize it's so close. And even for us, we say it every day, we walk there and then there's different, you know, there's different phases. Like when the carnival would come to East Point and sit on a little lot, we would walk kids down there like every summer, a couple of times, or, you know, the fact that there's festivals, it's really close. And for us, it just made it clear, we have to really articulate a clearer vision mm -hmm. with our city officials. But again, it's making time and space for that, but also sharing to with our other arts colleagues, the importance of space. Early on when we came to the region, we knew that without a space, you would be jumping around like crazy and we were offered lots of places downtown Atlanta to help build out and develop spaces for others. And it came with a lofty price tag. And we always knew that that wasn't something that we wanted because what we discovered is that we are an attraction. And so many times artists build a space and then people start coming to the space and all of a sudden you can't afford to be in the space because the rent is gonna get jacked up because you have built a space that is desirable and people see that families and friends come to this space. So for us, when we were able to land a space in East Point, although it wasn't the perfect space, it was perfect for us. And we knew that that was our solid place where we could create make art and it became a welcome center to this day we're not there all the time like we used to be but people pop in all the time and then they'll text go where are you I'm like we, we don't live there <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's the importance and as much as we can share that with other artists that have those frustrations and as we know it's only getting worse as everybody discovers the the beautiful virtue of living in the South with space is really changing a lot of our worlds and it's getting more congested. So I think that people that wanna make art, this is important information that we can share and how we have become this beacon of hope and light. And now after 32 years, people are starting to see our little engine that could, and that's why we painted our our building red. We've always been like, I think I can and chugging along, you know, that's important for us. So I think it's a beautiful program as many people that can get involved and be in the running, <laughs> running for the application, it will really boost your organization to the next level if you have something that you really are very clear. And even if you're not all the way clear, it can help you become more clear about what you want to do or what you want to achieve. And I will say, you know, Josh and Marion are very helpful in helping you to see that and then receiving a great team to help you think out things and to give you different perspectives is very helpful because we don't see things, you know, like others see it from the outside in. Well, you just went ahead and answered my next two questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> but so my question is, um, you know, you shared so much about what is valuable about this program, like, you know, getting an arts organization out from the studio, out from the day to day, you know, running a business um, and doing your work. You know, what is what else 
I mean, what might you say would be the most valuable thing you gained from this experience? And, and you also mentioned um, being, you know, being aware of the development that's happening, being aware of these plans that, you know, you used to be able to go to city council regularly, but now, I mean, you're just so busy doing the work that it's really hard to feel connected to all this stuff, all the development that is happening um, because Atlanta is growing so quickly. So, you know, is there something especially valuable that you gained from this program? I think yeah, the name, yeah, the name, yeah. the I ARC say, name. I, yeah. yeah, I would say for me, uh, in particular, it's a combination of the ALMA program and the ARC. And it was the fact that, you know, when I started, I really wasn't thinking about, um, you know, going any further with my schooling. And that really encouraged me to come uh, to go to the Irish World Academy of Music and Dance and uh, get my master's in ethno choreology. Um, and the reason that I did I wanted it in ethno choreology is because it's the study of people, societies, communities, how they create music, dance and culture and what the implications are of that. I didn't want just a dance degree. I had been doing dance and it would have been the easy road for me. But I think the ARC had, you know, expanded my view. And so, you know, um, what, 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 what that did then was it encouraged me to move further. And then uh, to go a step further, it also encouraged me to write the grant for uh, Dance USA, the archiving fellowship in which we were um, uh, one of the recipients of the, that fellowship. And re, uh, we actually completed our uh, program for Urban Nutcracker, for the uh, history of Urban Nutcracker. And a lot of that came from my 30-year uh, timeline in my thesis, but, but I didn't cover all of the years of Urban Nutcracker. And it, what it did was it helped me understand the importance of documentation, of really telling your story from every aspect of the organization. And I think this is what the archiving does. You realize how certain simple things are important. The community, the things that you're engaged with in the community. I think about the, uh, our history of working with the um, East Point Parade. You know, like you forget about that. The Georgia Power Parade of Excellence. There were so many things that I completely ignored because we've done so much and worked with so many different communities. But I think what, um, what the ARC has done is actually now made us more aware of how we have to keep that connection. We can't just do it and let it go. It's not you know up to, oh, they remember. No, we remember, we have to stay engaged. We can't just expect people because it's like business is going on. Just as we're in our little silo, others are in their mm -hmm. silo. So what we have to do is we have to be proactive and active in you know staying engaged. Thanks, I really. So there was a question in the chat about what was Alma, and Alma is the Arts Leaders of Metro Atlanta program, which is a precursor, really. Like when I when I was speaking in the beginning about what we've been doing over the past two years. Um, we've been using Alma, which is the Arts Leaders of Metro Atlanta program, uh, which is a program that's been going on um, for around 20 years. We used the last two years of that program to really think about what, again, how arts and culture can be an integral and essential part of how we think about local and regional planning. And to bring in artists um, and creatives to work with us as we think about planning and engagement. So this that was really the precursor to what we're talking about today, which is culture and community design, uh, which is a much more, um, focused program um, to bring artists um, and together with planners um, and people working in local government to think through how arts and culture can be a, um, a, a means uh, of really thinking about these, these challenges that we have in our communities um, and our opportunities as well. So um, with that, I'll just ask the final question, which is, um, and, and you all have, been addressing this this whole time as well, but you know, what should community-based organizations or arts and culture organizations be thinking about um, as they apply for this program? I think they should be thinking about future lofty goals because many times we're in the now and we don't think about what the future. I think um, 
what is it, the ARC, your end of the, your big program conference is coming up is called Owning Our Future. So for us, owning our future was owning it in the present because we started out as young dancers. And before you know it, time goes. Look, we're already October 13th, y'all. It's almost the end of another year. So I think about thinking ahead while thinking about the now at the same time. What are the lofty goals that you want to achieve so that you can continue to spit out those seeds when you meet people is very important and to be really intentional about that. Because if you don't, you're not going to arrive where you want to arrive as time elapses. So that's what I would say. Even now, much of what we said we wanted 32 years ago, I feel like in many ways, we're the James Brown of dance. We're starting to arrive at it at an advanced age. But the great thing about it is that we're comfortable where we sit in our own skin, you know, when you're younger, you have so much angst about trying to do the most all the time, but the experience is good, bad, and other just put you in a place where you can receive and listen and really put things in their proper perspective. And then the other thing I think is for me is for organizations to take time to sit still, to even pull all the pieces together. We have so many pieces hitting us in a day. Sometimes I think about, gosh, we have all the pieces of this puzzle, but because we're moving so fast, we can't even see how to put them together. We um, worked with Perkins and Will just before you guys, and they designed like our dream plan for the renovation of our building. So it made us understand what the outside could look like and then as your as our team came around and we talked about those potential footprints to East Point, we realized that could be a part of that. And then most recently we received a grant from the city of East Point. And mm -hmm. now we have some money set aside to implement a portion of what we are thinking about. So again, those puzzle pieces, thank you. Those puzzle pieces are right there or they're coming together. But if you're so busy, you have to take that downtime to think about the future or getting there. I think what I would challenge the organization to do is, you know, as Nina mentioned about the authenticity, is to really reflect on what their purpose is, their true purpose is. I noticed a lot of organizations uh, moving towards social issues you know, during the time of popularity, when it was popular, you know, that I know, okay, they've never done this. They don't, and, and then I saw as, as it died down, how many have faded from that and they're back to norm. So, I'm, and, and, and that's something that I look at and that's why I value uh, history. That's why I value the knowledge of, of, of really reflecting on organizations, learning the total scope of organization. And so I would really challenge them, you know, to really be authentic in what they're doing or what they choose as a social issue and to make sure that they're maintaining that. Because I think what happens is as artists and that's what makes us look trivial when we jump around, you know, uh, and, 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 and you don't really see a, a passion, a lifelong commitment to making those improvements. And, you know, and it, it's like everyone can't, uh, be a part of every uh, social issue. But if you pick your social issues and you become a champion of that, then that is effectiveness. And this is what I've done with the ethnic, And this is what I, I've really stayed on everyone else to even, you know, sometimes when it's not very popular, I've had to battle the board over having a community garden. Oh, well, that's just extra work. No, but it's, it's spiritual, it's healing. The healing drum circle, that's healing. You know, so how can that be wrong if I'm infusing something of positivity in the community and, it, and it's, a, it's something that, you know, they're being charged for everything. You have a cultural cul-de-sac, it's a free event. And so what we're saying is we're giving back. Uh, we're not waiting for the grants to come in to give back. What we're doing is we're giving back and then 
hoping that in the hearts of people, they'll understand and they'll not, even if they don't contribute to us, then they will, and they will look at it as something that they should be giving and not, you know, with the handout receiving, you know? And so, so this is, I think is the most important part. What are you doing to uplift your community on an ongoing basis and freely? Wow, I really love that. And I think it's really good, um, you know, to think about how you're staying true to your mission. I think, you know, oftentimes as a nonprofit founder myself, it's easy to, to be chasing like whatever's cool, right? Like, you know, like whatever's of the moment or whatever their, you know, funders are giving money out for right now. Um, but I would just encourage you all to like, you know, follow Waverly's advice and be like, when you're thinking about a project, when you're thinking about participating in this uh, in this program, um, what is your focus, right? What is the heart of what you do? And it may not align with this program. I mean, honestly, so like, you know, we want to support you all in really making real what is at the core of what you do? What is at the heart of what you do? So, so I mean, I just wanted to echo Waverly. Um, so, I, you know, we're I at, call that chasing the hype. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. I'm going to remember that one, chasing the hype. Um, so we don't want you to chase the hype. Um, does anyone have any questions? I mean, Waverly and Nina have given us so much good, many things to think about. Um, anyone have any questions for you all while, while, while they're still here with us? before we move into the program um, and the application. The application is not hard. None of it's <laughs> hard is what I would say. Yeah, so it's easy. It just requires a thought on the front end. And then again, you have great people to guide you through even thinking about what you wanna do, both Josh Joss was really great about helping us to think through. And so I think if you have an idea, it can be flushed out even better, so. Absolutely. Well, great. Well, thank you so much, Nina. Sandy's hand. Oh, oh, okay. This is a question, was your board involved at all or part of the process? Um, we inform the board of what we're doing and some of them more involved than others. We have some really long-term board members that, wow, <laughs> they were definitely involved. And then, you know, there are people that are have kids or work or had some sick issues, but yeah, the board definitely, because it's going to impact how we use, or it did impact how we used our time a little bit, not much how we shifted our time. So, and then they were excited about it because it was it was tied to the overall initiatives that we were doing at the time. So, yeah. Well, if that's all, if that's all the questions, um, I'm gonna say thank you to Nina and Waverly for joining us. Thank you for working with us this year. Um, we're so excited about all you're doing and we're excited to watch you perform at our state of the region um, event in about two weeks. So thank early you so much. It's so early, <laughs> but thank, thank you. you so much. Have a fantastic day, everybody. Thank Bye. you. See you soon. All right. Um, so with that, I'm gonna pass it to Josh. Um, Josh has a, uh, a lot of information to share um, about the program and the application process. Great. Thank you, thank you, Marianne. And again, thank you, Nina and Waverly and Lisa, who's also on here from Battle Ethnic. Um, it was such a pleasure to work with them in the in the program this year um, and, to, and to continue to see them working on um, some of the things that we discussed there. So always, always glad to see that. All right, so we're going to um, we're going to pivot now from talking about sort of uh, what 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 the experience of of um, Battle Ethnic and a, a group going through this program in this in this last iteration of the program and talk about what what we actually discuss in 
and, and cover in the program. So this is going to be a little bit from the perspective of um, a participant who's going through the program. So one of the people who will be on a team working with organizations, but it all integrates with what the organization's experience is. So we think about the uh, the program content of the, of the program as having three main things. One is there's a strong component of learning. So we bring in local and national experts who are working in the arts and working in planning and, and how those two things go together. So these are artists, these are um, community leaders, um, these are thinkers, these are doers, people who are out there doing their. So um, for, for instance, in this last year, well, this is Kalinda Lee, who was at the time at the Atlanta History Center um, talking about her work in the in community. We had uh, last year, we had Roberta Badoya, who's the cultural affairs manager for the city of Oakland. Uh, Wallace Johnson, who's an artist in New York, whose practice confronts the history of redlining. Um, come and speak. They spoke remotely with us, but they were, we had conversations with them, discussions. We learned from their expertise and, and the participants were able to discuss with them. And these we chose these speakers because we knew they, were directly uh, their experience was applicable to the class overall and to the projects that we were specifically were working in. Uh, there's a strong component of discussion where uh, people in the class discuss with each other, with us as a staff, with again with our speakers um, about the topics that we're 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 covering. So as an example, we. Um, put together a something we call the spectrum of community engagement, um, which is a really a way of looking at different community engagement activities and processes and trying to uh, really analyze and think about how we can move um, engagement activities from just sort of mere uh, involvement of the community to actually putting the community in a leadership position. So one the uh, engagement processes in a, in a planning in a planning uh, um, context where, where the community is leading and designing how they are engaged in a project and using arts and culture as a key part of doing that. So that was a that's a, it's a longer topic and just trying to give you a little little sense of one of the things that we we covered and we we cover lots of different topics and there's a really a chance for the class to discuss their own experiences and bring those to the table and learn from each other as much as it is learning from the ARC or from our guests. And then of course this program is heavily project based. So um, you people are working on a team. So working working with folks from with have very different experiences um, and different talents and skills that they're all bringing together in a cross discipline team. Um, working towards a deliverable. These are these uh, these projects have really clear deliverables that are are designed by the organization or are chosen by the organization and ARC helps sort of find those and get them into something that we can actually deliver on. Um, there are these project bases have strong community engagement goals, and we have um, this year there'll be community engagement activities, so actually things that are working with with the community that the organization serve, and we have a budget that goes along with that as well. And then these projects are all working towards implementation, so we want this to be something that actually actually happens, gets past the planning phase. So that's a strong focus of this year is how do we set this, set these projects up so that they can be implemented towards the end of this process and really going forward after that. Uh, so that's sort of, those are some of the things that we cover um, in, the, in the program. Um, I'll talk now a little bit about, oops, I went backwards. In the wrong direction here. All right, here we go. So let me just, I'll use this program timeline to discuss a little bit about how the, what you actually are doing day in, day out as a program participant, and then also as a, as an organization. So we will be kicking off the program on Valentine's Day with a breakfast. This is a shorter, just a couple hours where we'll orient, people will meet each other, learn a little bit more about what we're going to be doing. And then we'll really get started on March 7th, which is the first of our six program days. These are 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. days. They're going to be in person. Um, many of them will be at our 
location at the ARC. We have a big conference center with lots of space. You see it pictured in the top picture there. But we will also be scheduling some days that are out in the community in a different location so we get a chance to see, see and talk about um, actual community space other than just downtown uh, Atlanta. So those are the six days, March 7th through September 12th. The last one is the final presentation day. Uh, we'll also be doing site visits. This is where each team will meet with their organization, um, and those will be happening in April. And we will, they will be scheduling uh, one or two community co-design sessions. So this is an actual engagement activity with the community, and those will be happening in June in one of those two weeks. Uh, the for the rest of the rest of the time, we do expect there will be some time outside of class that teams are meeting. Um, we've tried to design the design the program so the major work that you'll be doing is during these program days or in the site visits, but there will be some time outside that they're working on this. And I think for organizations, I think this is also a really important thing to know because although there's only sp specific times in here that you'll be you'll be engaged directly with the class, and I'll go over what those are. One piece we'll also be talking about is having someone from your organization participate in the program. So these, these dates are important as well for that. Um, all right, I'm going to move on to what it means to be an organization, what your commitment as an organization partnering with the culture and community design program would mean. So we're going to start, we're going to start with uh, 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 December of this year, December through January of this year, we would expect an organization to be available for a couple one hour meetings with the ARC team. This is where we'll help develop the program, the project with you and really work on what everything you'll be doing throughout this program would be. That'd be in December and January. February through September is when the majority of the work is going to happen. And throughout that time, we would schedule, we work with the teams and you to schedule three 90 minute meetings where they can learn more at the beginning. They can check in partway through the program with you. This is something we learned last year is that we really needed a, to have some check in. So as they start to develop and put ideas down that there's a chance to check, make sure they're on the right, right path. Uh, and then another one somewhere in there to help, help figure, help, help them move along. Um, so those will be happening throughout. Those will be scheduled. Um, the first thing that we definitely know is that we'll start on March 7th with a 20-minute in-person presentation, which you would come and present to the whole class, to both of the teams, um, your team and the other team. Um, we want both the teams to sort of understand what the project, both the projects are, but this is where your team would get its first real taste about what you are, what your organization is about and what your project is about. Uh, like I said, there'll be a site visit in April. So this is two and a half hours. I'll come to, if you have a physical location in community, that's great, come there, that makes sense. If it's if you work throughout a larger community, we'll work with you to decide where the best place is or best places. Um, for instance, when we worked with We Love Buford Highway, who works up and down Buford Highway, we picked a couple places to go to, Plaza Fiesta and the Chinatown Mall. These are two, two important places that they picked for us to go and see and, and, um, and be in the community. One thing we definitely want to do is we would love to have community members actually involved in this. So not just the staff we want to bring in, even though staff could be key community members as well, we want to bring in additional community members as well to be, to be part of this. Uh, in June, there'll be, this is when we've, we've, uh, there'll be some actual community engagement activities designed by the class with the organization to work with the community that you work with. And those are, those are open to what they will, can be, but the community will definitely be involved in that. It could be connected to an event you're already doing. It could be something on its own. That's for the, the team and you to decide. Uh, and then this will all culminate, um, the the program, the Carlton Community Design Program part of this will culminate on September 12th, where the, uh, the, the teams will be presenting to you, to the rest of the class, to invited guests, what they have come up with. So this is a this is going to be at the ARC and our Harry West Conference Center, and the team will stand up and, and go through its presentation in whatever format that looks like. And we want you there to provide feedback and to participate in that conversation and a little celebrating. 
we've gotten to the, this part in the program. Uh, it's not over though at that point. That's the formal end of the program. And for the participants, the individual participants, that's their contract with us through this program will be to the to the to that point. After that, um, we'll do a debrief with you. We'll talk about what's what's next, and we'll we'll have other conversations in the in the fall about how to connect with other ARC programs. And this is where. Um, uh, uh, our colleague Molly, who's on the call, she's going to be talking to you in a minute, will really, really, she'll be involved throughout, but this is where she'll really um, be stepping up because she manages some of the other programs um, that will could be potentially rolling into working with there. So I'm going to um, move on to one part I talked about earlier, and this is um, last year, we had three organizations. Um, one of the organizations, we were trying to sort of figure out the best way to do this. One of the organizations had one of their staff participate as a, as a member of the class, as well as being a staff member of the organization we were working with. Um, and it's something that we wanted to build into the class this year. So as part of being a selected organization, we will reserve one spot for a staff member from your organization. Could be the director, it could be um, you know another staff person. Um, if there's something else you want, someone else you want to pitch for us, that's certainly something we can talk about. But we would really like to have organizations be represented by a staff person during the program. Um, they can be the voice of the organization. They provide that strong connection to an understanding of the organizational mission, leadership, and community, which is really really key because so oftentimes. Um, you know, once the meeting, you know, the initial meeting is done with the organization, you know, you may have follow up questions. And although there's certainly a way to ask those to have someone who's actually there on the team is really, really helpful. And then we think there'll be a really key to help transition into implementation. So at the end of the program, this is someone who's still involved with the organization. So we'll ask you in the application to identify who this might be, who this would be in your organization. So be thinking about that, who gets to do that. And honestly, it's also great opportunity for this individual person besides just their role in the organization to get to go through this class as well. All right, um, just uh, so we'll, um, we will be for organizations that participate in this, um, we will be each of the two organizations will be paid $3,000 for their experience and expertise with the communities they serve and for fulfilling their program commitments. In addition to that, we have a budget uh, available of up to $2,000 for the co-design community engagement activities. So those are the things in June that we'll be doing. There's a budget that's available up to $2,000 for that. And um, with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to Molly to talk about how this connects to our other programs here. So Molly. Welcome to the stage. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I haven't been here a while, but this is the first time we're talking. Um, again, I'm Molly Bogle. I manage our Community Development Assistance Program. I'm going to take you back in time just a little bit to give you a foundation uh, for you to understand sort of where I am coming from and my team uh, and where we will be fitting into this process. So the Community Development Assistance Program, or CDAP, was established in 2018 uh, to provide planning and technical assistance to local governments, community improvement districts, or CIDs, and nonprofits uh, to undertake local planning activities that advance the goals of the region's plan. Now, we did that for a couple of years, uh, but then the pandemic hit, and we shifted gears in terms of where our focus really uh, was. So in 2020, uh, uh, we added two goals, and those were to promote and advance uh, community uh, equity and resiliency. Along with that idea, we really wanted to start engaging with community-based organizations, which was something that uh, our colleagues, Marion and Josh, were already doing. And so it took a couple of years to kind of figure out what that looked like in terms of how we would fit into that role. Um, we opened up our application process to include community-based organizations, but we wanted to have a, a greater effect there. So that's where this new program comes into play and where uh, we as CDAP staff uh, will be more active in this program. So 
We will be um, offering additional planning assistance on uh, all of these planning days. We'll be there through every step of the process, listening, learning as well. Uh, but one key element there is that um, as we go throughout this, we're going to be finding ways that we think these projects will fit into other programs, specifically our Livable Centers Initiative, and uh, which is LCI, or our Transportation Improvement Program, or TIP. Uh, I'm not going to read those out to you. You can read those there. But um, the Livable Centers Initiative, or LCI, is another planning program. Um, but it is going to be something that uh, the, these projects will fit within a larger, um, what's called a transit-oriented development uh, plan. And then the TIP uh, program are going to be those actual um, uh, bricks and mortar uh, implementation funds. And so we're going to be trying to find ways where these projects fit within these larger plans or implementation um, uh, elements. And uh, we just want to make sure it says here, you know, we're a planning organization. We love our plans, but what we love more than plans are seeing those plans come to life. So uh, we want to make sure that those plans uh, or those projects that we have are, are going to be something that we can really funnel through those existing programs that we have here uh, to bring more money um, and to bring those uh, plans and projects to fruition. Um, as you might notice uh, from the descriptions and the uh, of, of the LCI and TIP programs there, these are transportation funds. They come from federal and state uh, transportation funds. So there does have to be that transportation element. And that's why we're at the table. We're kind of taking in what we hear and seeing how can we make sure that we fit that within um, the goals and missions of those programs. Um, so that's what we're gonna be doing there. We're really excited. Um, and uh, if you have any questions for me about the work that we do with CDAP, what our role will be LCI. Um, we've got our new program manager for LCI on the call as well. Um, but we're really excited and uh, really looking forward to getting this started and really looking forward to making sure that we take these past the finish line um, and into the implementation phase. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. And and you know, as as you continue to think about uh, these things, and I know there's all there's, these are all huge, long, big programs with long histories, and there's a lot of examples of projects that have gone through there. But as you think about if you're thinking about those and if you have further questions, we'll definitely have time at the end to come back to those. So you can put them in the chat now um, or hold on to them and you can ask more questions about those specifically. We're going to move on, though, to talk about the actual process of applying, the filling out the application. And um, uh, I, uh, I'm so glad that Nina said it was an easy process. We have changed a little since last year, but our intent is to make this straightforward. So um, uh, one thing that I'll say, I'll say it again, is that you may come and talk to us before this application. You have to turn in the application. In fact, that's my first item on my next slide. We are available. Contact us to discuss your ideas before the deadline. Well, Marion's email address is going to be up at the end. It's on the website as well. Um, contact her. We can talk about like what 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 makes sense. Um, what fits. We don't want you to like, like, we don't want you to be stretching and doing something that doesn't make sense for, for you all, but we can help if there's options, like what, what would work best with a program like this. So that's, that's the, really the first, first step to propose, to proposing a, being a part of this program is ask a questions if you have those, whether it's today or later before the deadline. The deadline is on November 10th. Um, that is, we will take take a, those up up to midnight. You don't have to wait till the last minute, but um, uh, you have until then. We will be reviewing those proposals from mid November through mid December. Um, the review will, of course, involve our team reading what you've put in there, um, but it'll also, um, if we think we need to, uh, it may involve scheduling a short meeting with your organization to just ask any questions we have or talk through any details on that. And then we'll be making a decision and notifying organizations in late December. Uh, so you will you will know either way. Um, to apply, you can go to our website. The website is right down here, AtlantaRegional.org. There's a little shortcut at CCD for Culture and Community Design. We don't intend to call it CCD, but 
You go to that place, it'll take you right to where you can read all about the program and you can submit a proposal. There's a submit a proposal button there. So when you get to that, um, well, just actually before that, just one, one thing about what we're, what our priorities are in terms of organizations that we're looking for. Um, we are specifically seeking to include organizations that represent communities that have been traditionally marginalized or excluded in local and regional planning processes. And then we have some examples here, um, of course, including communities, Asian American, Arab American, Black, Latino, immigrant, Native American, Pacific Islander, LGBTQ plus communities, people with disabilities, people experiencing homelessness, residents with low income, young people. These are examples of communities that were specific we are we are prioritizing that we would really like to work with uh, and that's an important part of this program um, so if you have questions about that and whether your organization fits again talk to us and we can ask you you know we can talk to you on a on a uh, um, about your specific um, organization and the community that you serve um, just one thing to point out about this some of these are communities that will be defined geographically for a neighborhood or a community um, others might be broader. So, you know, just as an example, last year we worked with We Love Buford Highway. They specifically serve the communities and people who live in the Buford Highway community on the corridor there. Um, we also worked with the Aleph Institute, which has a location. It's a physical location that people come to, but they're working with the Arab American community throughout the region. It's not really defined by geography there. Um, and then there's all sorts of organizations that are going to work with communities in different ways. So we're, we know that it doesn't look the same for every organization. Um, and that's something that we'll be, we'll be happy to talk to you about if you have specific questions about that. Um, so when you're actually filling out the application, we're going to ask some questions. Um, and there are around three, three different areas. So the first one is about your organization. What is your organization's mission? That's a simple one. You're putting your mission in there. What, what, uh, where do you provide services? So where, where, where those services happen and, and who does your organization serve? And again, for some organizations, the where might be really important. For others, the where might be a little less defined. Who does your organization serve is always, of course, important. Who are the people of your community that are um, um, participate in, in your organization's work? Um, we want to know about what the community opportunity is, or what is the project that you you are interested in, and why why you're interested in this opportunity, and really, you know, sort of like where where did this come from? Too is this something that your organization has been working on, um, you know, for years and years? Is this something that there's changed in the community that is that is important to address now? Um, who was involved in making this a priority? in your community? Does it come from staff or the board? Does it come from people in the community? How is that, how does that, how does that inform what you you want to do? Um, how do your organization's programming and activities align with the purpose and goals of our program? And these are on our on the on the program page. Marion talked about them as well. And we can, if you have questions about that, we can go into that, but you, I encourage you to look on the program page. Because um, we've done a lot of thinking about what what the goals of this program is, and we want it to be a good fit. And then we want we want to understand the specificity of the challenge and the opportunities. Um, what are the outcomes that you want? Um, how will being part of this program help you achieve those outcomes too? So again, this is to the fitting with our program, and it's, it's as much for for your your outcomes as it is for for our program outcomes too. We want a good fit here. And then um, the last major piece is your organizational capacity. And really what we're talking about here is, is like who, who is it, who's going to be working with us and what is what is what are their staff roles and how do they fit into the organization and, and how will they fit into this program? And this is, of course, where we will ask you about um, your key staff person that would participate as, in the program as a participant as well as being a representative for the organization there. Um, so each of these questions, we have a we have a character count, number of characters. Um, you don't have to fill up the entire, you know, you don't have to write every single character on there. But I think 
you know, ones that we're thinking there might be a, more to talk about, we've given you more characters for ones that were like a shorter answer would probably do. We've given you less characters for there. So use that as a use that as a guide. All right. Um, and then so we given those are the questions we asked. We wanted to give you a little bit of an idea. And this is on the site as well, too, about what we're thinking about. What are our criteria that we've we have in mind when we are evaluating these these proposals? We're looking for organizations that demonstrate a deep commitment experience with the communities they serve, have the capacity to be able to participate fully in the program, and are ready to implement the ideas and recommendations that emerge from this program. I mean, that's literally we write the questions and the applications to these criteria. So this is this is what kind of what we are guiding our guiding principles and what we're looking for in an organization. We want projects that will be eligible for future ARC funding. So this is some of what Molly was talking about our CDAP program, our LCR, our Community Development Assistance Program, our Livable Centers Initiative, um, is, is we want um, projects that fit into the work that we do through there. So projects that advance transportation and mobility equity, sustainable land use, housing affordability, environmental and climate justice, and if you're looking at those and thinking like, how does my work fit into that? And maybe it does, and maybe it doesn't. That's a great thing to ask us specifically about because there's a lot included in there. And I know as someone who came into planning five, six years ago, that when I first saw those, I was like, well, I have one specific idea of what that means, but there's a lot, a lot that could be included in that. So ask about that if you're not sure. Um, we want applications. Yeah. Sorry, I'm going to ahead, chime in. Is that if you read that list and think you don't fit, talk to us because yeah. we'll find we'll find a way. Yeah, yeah. for sure. For if sure. If you if you work with people, we can make it work. So. Yeah. Thank you, Marion. Um, we want applications that clearly articulate the community challenge or opportunity as well as desired project outcomes. So you don't have to have everything completely in line, like this is where I want it to go, but having an idea about what, what you think you're going to, what's going to come of this is really helpful for us. And we can help develop that um, with you or talk you through it, but uh, um, having some sort of starting thing with, this is where I'm trying to go. Um, we're trying to go, and this is what the, what the issue is or what the opportunity is, then um, that's really helpful for us when we're reading about it. Um, we only get to work with two organizations and a small, you know, a small group of people. Um, we always are looking for opportunities for to learn from this process as an agency um, and and help to share that across the region with other communities with the region at whole. So we're looking for organization and projects that have potential for shared learning, adoption, implementation across the region, um, which means that afterwards we may be like, oh, hey. And then we really come back and talk to, you know, talk to us about like what you've learned from this, because we can then have them share in this setting or in other settings um, what what they've learned. So that's something that's important, like that we can continue to learn together and, and share what we've learned um, to other other parts of the region. And then, of course, we're a regional uh, agency. So we're looking for organizations from across the 11 county region served by the ARC. Okay, um, so that's our selection criteria. We are that's that's all the stuff we have to push out at you right now. But please, please, if you have questions, and I haven't looked at it, but I see some maybe in the chat here. Um, please, please let us know what your questions are. Yeah, there's a lot of information. So if you you know haven't processed all of that and have a question for us now, definitely feel free to email me. Um, like Josh said, we're happy to talk. Um, do, you, do you want to talk through the question you answered in the chat here too? Oh yeah, sure. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, so the question was, there is an individual portion of the program. Are they expected to be inside or related to the um, organization? or are they completely separate? And so the answer to that is the individuals that are applying to this program um, do not have to be connected with, affiliated, or part of any of the um, 
part of your work or it doesn't, didn't have to be a, um, connected to an applicant organization. Um, like Josh mentioned, we are asking that you send a staff person to participate in our program. Um, we just think that the quality of the resulting recommendations are much stronger and much um, you know, more specific to what you all as organizations are seeking. So to have that person be embedded in our program um, is really gonna be helpful to you all um, so that you have recommendations at the end of the program that are really specific to your needs. Um, but that person does not have to apply separately. That, that person that you are sending from your organization, whether it's a staff person or, um, you know, like a really, really knowledgeable volunteer um, or a board member, um, that person will be, you will include the name of that person in your application process. So they do not have to apply separately. Uh, does the organization applying need to be a 501c3 or a fiscally sponsored organization eligible? Um, so, no, you do not have to be because there's no, the funding that is coming to the organization is not, does not um, have the typical string that would be attached for you to, um, to receive the, the funding. So it does not have to be a 501c3. Uh, what are the qualifications for the individual applicants? Um, so that is something that is listed in the individual um, portion of the application on the website, but the individuals that we're looking for are going to be artists um, and creatives and culture bearers with a socially engaged practice or with a civic practice. So um, it's a little bit different from the 2022 program because we are looking for working artists um, or culture bearers who have, who already have some experience of community engagement, who have a practice that is really focused um, and oriented toward uh, community involvement, um, whether their practice is, you know, working with community members, gathering stories, um, and then is, uh, the medium is, you know, within the community in a way, there has to be a stronger um, connection to an experience with an expertise with working with communities. Um, and then that we're also looking for planners, um, architects, designers, um, because that is our practice. As a um, agency, you know, our work is really focused on long range planning, whether that's around uh, community development um, or transportation, natural resources, workforce development. Our our role as an agency, uh, we're we're interested in working with professionals with um, that planning background. Um, and then also the third group that we are seeking for individual applicants is really going to be people working in local government, whether that's as a, a elected official or whether that's um, you know the economic development director of a city or a county. Um, because we really want um, this kind of approach um, to transportation, to community development. We want this approach to really not just be within our agency, but really be practiced throughout the region by our member jurisdictions. Um, so those are those are the individual applicants that we're we're really seeking. And I'll just say if if. Uh... This, this, although we talked about individuals, this session really was focused on organizations. We're going to have a session on the 27th that's specifically for individuals. So if you know someone who uh, you think would be a great fit for this or you yourself are interested, I would encourage you to have them sign up for the October 27th one as well, because we'll go into a little more, little more detail at that point. Good catch, Josh. Thank you. Any other questions? Any questions about um, the the um, Global Centers Initiative, Community Development Assistance Program, those other programs as well? We're happy to talk about any of those here. And I know that you know this may be the first time that you're learning about these kinds of programs, so there's no wrong question. Yeah.
it might be easier for me to uh, just unmute to ask this one, but yeah. for the yeah. for the community development program, how uh -huh. far along in the planning uh, do you have to be to to start that conversation? I mean, if you have no no site, no building plan, nothing, can, can you start having that conversation now? Or you mean are you asking for uh, with respect to who can apply to the community development assistance program? Yes, or or just yeah. to get that conversation started, because I, I don't think that this is for another organization, but I, I don't think that there is a specific project like fully formed, but just mm -hmm. learning more about the program and, and as we start planning. That would be a great conversation for you to have with Molly. Okay, great. Molly, are you there? I am, yeah. <laughs> Can we, um, I'm going to throw my email in the chat and uh, if you'll just shoot me an email, we can uh, jump on a, jump on a call soon and we can kind of talk through what your ideas are. Okay. Does that Thank good? you. Yes. Thanks. Great. Well, great. Thank you everyone for coming. Really appreciate your interest. Um, and like I said, it's a lot of information. So please feel free to email me um, and we can we can have another conversation about that. Is there oh. an existing LCI for the area? Oh, if. Good question. Huh. Good question. Lauren, do you wanna take a shot at that one? <laughs> <laughs> um, or we can also ask Sam. Yeah. Yeah. If there's an existing LCI for the area, um, yeah. I mean, if 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 the project is located within an existing LCI, I think um I think we could certainly look at how the two fit together. Um yeah. and so just to chime in, right? There's a few, there's a few different ways to do it. If it's an old LCI, which was done a while ago. There's obviously, and and what's being proposed coming out of this is significant enough that it it is uh, it can trigger what we'd call like an LCI update, which is to update the plan. Then we would work with 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 y'all the, the um, and then the local government or the local sponsor who would do the project to bring them together and say, hey, can we sit down and talk about updating your LCI? And as part of updating the LCI, looking how do we incorporate um, what we have, what we're uh, been going through through this program, and then that would be a potential new application, which uh, uh, which which would look which which would be a whole new update to the program, and then so that's if it's an old. And what I mean by old LCI is typically, uh, you know, a community will do this kind of plan, long range plan, and then try to implement it for a few years, and then circumstances changes, the economy changes. You know, a lot of different things happen, and then they that requires you to update the the plan so that it reflect, uh, reflects the current needs and and changing future. So um, that so that's one way to approach it. The other way, which I can see it, is if it's a recently done study, but this is something that we want to make sure is incorporated into that. We would again have a conversation with the local sponsor yeah. and see if there's a way to incorporate this as part of the LCI, because what that does is, um, which we haven't really got into, into too much here and we didn't have to, is LCI, part of it is the study program, which we have which we have a budget for, but then we also have a lot of money on the back end to implement the recommendations coming out of those studies. Now, while they're predominantly transportation improvements, but that is, that's broad. So what we could do is we update the LCI, then as part of that, we say, okay, how do we move forward what's recommended through this program towards implementation? And can we tap into those dollars that we have to actually do implementation? So um, working with, with Lauren, working with Molly, I think we can we can definitely find ways to, to uh, incorporate um, it into an existing LCI or, or plan for a new LCI study. Yep. That's Quick all forward. part of our plan. <laughs> yeah, that's part of the bigger, that's part of the so bigger I, picture. I will say, I mean, this is a great question that you asked, and I'm really glad that you're familiar with all these programs um, already because the the project, I mean, all three of the 
the the things that we worked on earlier this year, including with Balesnik, we live Buford Highway, um, and Aleph were all somewhat, were, they were all transportation related to a degree um, that could have, that could still lead to uh, funding opportunities. And I will say that like, um, I will say that as a community-based organization that is thinking about your involvement in making these plans come to life or even be part of the engagement process, be part of the planning process, is that I'm thinking about how we can partner with um, community-based organizations in a way in which the community-based organizations can be funded as well, right, for your work and participation participation, because I know that often community-based organizations are asked to um, share information, you know, with their, with their communities, asked to send out, push out surveys, asked to host a public meeting, but there is a more substantial role that our community-based organizations can play in all of this that I think they, they, they can play, um, where they are actually, you know, they know their communities best. You all know your communities best. Uh, we want to lean on you for guidance um, and leadership in thinking about ways that we can address the issues and opportunities in your community. So I will say, I will go far, a little bit farther than uh, what Lauren and Sam said and said that, you know, we're, this, is, this is really, you know, a, a larger, a, a larger, um, you know, outcome that we're thinking and I think I alluded to it in in, in our desired outcomes for this pro, for this work. So that was a lot of that was a big response. That was a long response <laughs> to, to your question, but it's a great question. One just quick follow up on that. If uh, someone's on this call and they are unsure about whether they live in or their organization works in a community that has an LCI, if they don't know that, how would you find out if you where an LCI was in your area? Um, well, Sam, I, I was going to yeah. just answer. I mean, it, the on the website, on the ARC website, there's a, um, a page that's um, got all of the LCI communities and studies that have been done. There's 131, I believe, LCI communities or areas at this point. So there's a good chance that um, you might be located in one. Um, and yeah, just just to reiterate what Marion said, I mean, we're we she and I have talked a lot about you know just overall involving community-based organizations in um, planning as a whole and how we can really uh, push that as an idea for the um, 2023 round of LCI um, applications and emphasize that. Um, and so I think this program is a great step, and we really hope to work together um, to make this all um, come to life. So. Great, okay. thank you. And I've just put links to uh, where you thank can you. search search that data database. Thanks, Josh. Well, good. If we don't have any more questions, uh, I'm gonna again thank you for your time, um, and we'll be in touch. Hopefully, we'll be in touch with some of you um, as you think about whether this is going to be a a good opportunity for you. And thanks so much for coming. Okay. Thank you all. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.